we're very pleased to have with us uh, our guests uh, uh, to mark the International Day for Mine Awareness and Assistance in Mine Action. Uh, they include, and I would ask uh, 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 our guests to raise their hands when I call them so you know which ones are, are where, because some are in the front rows and some are in, uh, at, at the table. But we have with us today uh, the acting director of the UN Mine Action Service, Eileen Cohn, uh, the special envoy for the universalization of the Anti-Personal Mine Ban Convention, and Lord Chamberlain of the Royal Hashemite Court, his Royal Highness, Prince Mered of Jordan, their permanent representative of Colombia to the United Nations, Ambassador Guillermo Fernandez de Soto, huh? oh. uh, uh, the, de the deputy permanent representative of Switzerland to the United Nations, Ambassador David Howdy, the director of the international campaign to ban landmines, Hector Guerra, and IED survivor and photographer, Giles Dooley. Um, I believe uh, I, I will now briefly vacate uh, this uh, uh, podium so that uh, Prince Mered can speak to you from here. And, and then the, the other speakers uh, will give their opening remarks in order before we turn to your questions. Prince Mered, please. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm... Uh, very grateful to the United Nations Mine Action Service, ANMAS, for the opportunity to join you all in this International Day for Mine Awareness and Assistance in, in Mine Action as a special envoy for the universalization of the Anti-Personnel Mine Ban Convention. My, my job has been to promote the universal imperative against the use of this weapon and promote adherence to the treaty's norms. In general, states' parties to the convention have done a good job uh, in the past 25 years. More than 53 million uh, stockpiled anti-personnel mines have been destroyed. Contaminated land in mine-affected uh, communities continue to be cleared uh, for their productive use. The rights and needs of mine uh, victims are somewhat addressed, although there is still much to do uh, to ensure that we provide this assistance, uh, not as a matter of charity, but as part of uh, wider frameworks in line with the CRPD. All in all, a tremendous, effort, tremendous benefit uh, has been derived from the Convention. The states' parties continue to show solidarity to one another by, by providing assistance and promoting uh, cooperation. This is true not only for, from donors to, towards affected countries, but through so-called South-South cooperation and innovative triangular approaches where one donor country provides the means for mine-affected countries themselves uh, to exchange experiences. Uh, this is a well-oiled uh, functioning humanitarian disarmament uh, treaty with 80% of the world proudly calling themselves states parties. Um, now we have to focus on the remaining 20%. Uh, in in a, a moment of growing conflicts around the world, we have to focus on the imperative against these uh, weapons. There are 33 uh, countries that have not joined. Among them, some that may be uh, holding collectively tens of millions of anti-personnel mines in their military warehouses and millions more uh, that they have unfortunately bury buried in the ground. Uh, a coordinated and concerted effort is needed at the highest level in order to achieve further accessions. This will not be easy, but is possible. Um, among the states that are not party to the convention, there are some states that have, have the power to significantly turn the tide and eliminate this uh, horrendous weapon, such as China, India, Pakistan, Russia, and the United States. Most of these states attend convention meetings and provide updates on their landmine policy. We, we encourage their continued participation in the work of the Convention. Co cooperation and assistance continues to be a key factor in our implementation efforts. According to the Landmine Monitor, in 2020, 33 donors contributed uh, a total of $565 million uh, in international support uh, for mine action across 40 affected countries. Of these, 26 were states parties to the treaty, while, uh, while other top donors were the U European Union and four other institutions. Two, however, two, however were states not party, the United States and the, and the Republic of Korea. I'm, I'm glad to report that both countries are actively 
participating in convention meetings and have expressed acceptance of the convention's norms and uh, humanitarian objectives. This, this is perhaps uh, as a good uh, an opportunity as any to call on these two states and to all states not yet parted, uh, but uh, that are on board with the aims of the convention to take their commitment another step further. While we hear the, their concerns for not joining, we see that they are, for the most part, observing many or most, if not all, of the Convention's norms. The United States, which is the world's second largest mine action uh, donor, and which uh, provided a lot of support to our national program in, in my country, in, in Jordan, uh, I, I would enc in, encourage it to reinstate its 2014 landmine policy, which was reversed in uh, 2020. Uh, this would uh, once again put the United States in a leadership position on this matter. As, as I mentioned, this call for uh, action is not just for the United States, but for all other countries which have not yet uh, uh, joined, but are de facto parties. I call on the Marshall Islands, N Nepal, Tonga, the Republic of Korea, Singapore, Vietnam, Laos, PDR, Lebanon, and others that have uh, a lot more in common with states parties than those not, states part not state parties. Uh, why, uh, why uh, you could ask, would uh, their joining be of importance if they do not possess or plan on using mines? Uh, because it strengthens the norm against landmines. It strengthens and re reiterates the fact that that uh, the casualties caused by these weapons, uh, of which a large number are children, are simply not acceptable. Uh, all countries have a role to play, a small Pacific uh, island nation to the, to the world's greatest military powers. We are concerned by the alleged use of antipersonal mines in, in one state not party, and by one state not party deploying mines within a state uh, party, uh, the Ukraine. The, uh, the convention's uh, president, uh, following her mandate, will speak more on, on, on that. But allow me to say that, uh, any, that any use of antipersonal mines is, is, regrettable, is a regrettable offense towards civilians. We call on any state using antipersonal mines or armed groups to, uh, that do so to refrain from using a weapon that has uh, been labeled as indiscriminate in nature, in, in, inhumane and abhorrent. We are not just referring to the fact that, uh, to referring to factory-made anti-personnel mines, but any use of a munition designed to be placed under or, or near the ground or other surface area and to be exploded by the presence, uh, proximity or contact of a person. And that will, uh, that, and that will inca incapacitate, injure or kill one or more persons. Improvised explosive devices that meet this cr criteria are anti-personnel mines and their use goes counter to humanitarian international law. There is no space in today's world for this weapon. I thank you all. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, before we turn to the next speaker, I wanted to uh, uh, add one more introduction. Uh, that in the center seat, we have uh, the permanent representative of Colombia to the UN office in Geneva and president of the 20th meeting of states parties of the Mine Ban Convention, Alicia Victoria Arango Olmos. Um, and uh, uh, please, uh, 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 you, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I want to start uh, thanking His Royal Highness Prince Mered for his dedication to promoting a treaty that is so universal, effective, and a great example of states and civil society working together. Creating the Mind Ban Treaty was such an innovative approach and so successful that it has been replicated to achieve other landmark treaties. This convention is very dear to me, not only in my role as president, but also as citizen of a country, Colombia, that is also playing a high price as a result of the contamination by these weapons. A country that is proudly and violently engaged to clear mines and assist mine victims as required by the treaty. Colombia's president has undertaken to promote the convention and its principles around the world. As we commemorate the day for mine awareness and assistance in mine and assistance in mine action, let's take the opportunity to highlight the effects of anti-personal mines on civilian populations in new conflicts like in Ukraine or in protracted ones in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, and Yemen. But also, unfortunately, in countries where peace has returned or peace deals have been brokered, places like Angola, Cambodia, Chad, Guinea-Bissau, or Zimbabwe. In these countries, 
and others like them, minds silently wait to claim a new victim. These minds do not know that peace has come. The next victims will most likely not be their intended targets. No, they will be civilians, including children. If they survive, these young victims will require assistance for their care and rehabilitations for the rest of their lives. They will require prothesis, psychological and psychosocial support, which they may never receive. Many countries with responsibility for mine victims are also amongst some of the poorest on earth. As president of the convention, I am also deeply concerned by reports that have surfaced in social and traditional media and verified by Human Rights Watch, which is part of the international campaign to ban land mining, indicating that anti-personal mines, both factory-made and of improvised nature, are being used by Russia in the current conflict in Ukraine. We must stand firm in the Convention's legally binding premise to never, under any circumstance, use anti-personal mines, develop, produce, otherwise acquire, stockpile, retain or transfer to anyone, directly or indirectly, anti-personal mines. We cannot turn a blind eye to this situation. It should be clear that the use of anti-personal mines by any party in conflict is prohibited under international humanitarian law. The use Okay. The use of anti-personal mines impede access to humanitarian corridors and prevent delivery of essential humanitarian emergency aid. That detrimental, aggravating scourge that these mines represent is undeniable. The state's parties to the convention remain firm in their conviction against these weapons. Therefore, I call on those countries outside our treaty that have been found to use anti-personal mines to end this inhuman use. Colombia and the other 163 state parties will continue promoting the need for states to provide assistance and care to mine victims and the universal observance of the Convention's norms and objectives, condemn violations of these norms, and take appropriate steps, steps to end the use, stockpiling, production, and transfer of anti-personal mines by any actor including by armed non-state actors. There is simply no place for this weapon in today's world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, now we have a statement by the director of the International Campaign to Ban Landmines, Hector Guerra. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here in this day when we celebrate years and years of mine action of great achievements. Uh, but it's also a day when we take conscience on all the work that is left to be done. 25 years ago, we all rejoiced when nations from around the world came together to adopt an international prohibition on the use, production, stockpiling, and transfer of anti-personal landmines, the Mine Ban Treaty. Today, we recognize this treaty as one of the most adhered disarmament uh, instruments, effectively establishing the global norm against the use of these indiscriminate and inhuman, inhumane weapons. The treaty set a humanitarian precedent as well by engaging with landmine survivors and communities impacted by the weapon and putting the rights and needs at the center of the discussion. This achievement was won through a strong partnership of states, civil society, the International Committee of the Red Cross, and the United Nations, which endures today and remains key to delivering on the full promise of the treaty. The immense and positive impact of the Mine Ban Treaty is cause for celebration. 164 countries on board and more than 30 now mine free. Hundreds of thousands of mines cleared and more than 55 million stockpile mines uh, destroyed. Those mines will never claim a limb or life, will never lie in the path of a child going to school 
or a mother or father using their land or going about their daily lives. For April, it's much more than celebration of an anniversary and simple cause for cheer. In 2022, we also know that the aspirational goal envisaged in the Mindban Treaty of no new victims and clearance of all mine contaminated lands by 2025 will not be achieved based on current trends. New use of mines in Ukraine by Russia and ongoing use of, uh, in Myanmar by the government has also shown that the Mayanban Treaty successes are not inevitable or without setbacks. Use of landmines by anyone, anywhere, anytime must be strongly condemned by the international community to safeguard the norm established 25 years ago and ensure the protection of civilians. Based on the, on the triumphs of the last 25 years since the Mayanban Treaty was adopted and 30 years since the founding of the international campaign to ban landmines, we remain convinced that a world free of landmines and cluster munitions is possible. We have already achieved the extraordinary through renewed commitment, strong political will, and effective partnership. The promise of a mine-free world within a, few, within a few short years is firmly within our reach. Thank you. Uh, thanks uh, very much. And, uh, and now uh, I turn the floor over to Mr. Giles Dooley. Over, over to you. Um, well, thank you for having me here today. Um, I have spent the last 20 years documenting the impact of war on civilians around the world. And I sit here today with the burden of 20 years of stories of landmine survivors and victims around the world. There are so many stories that I could share, but one that comes to mind is of a young boy in Afghanistan who I photographed in 2012. I myself was injured in Afghanistan in 2011. Um, I lost both my legs and my left arm to an IED. 18 months after that injury, I returned to Afghanistan to document people who had been injured like myself. I was at the ICRC limb fitting center when I met a young boy called Atola. People ask me, do you ever cry when you're making photographs? Does it ever overwhelm you? And I'll be honest, no, it's like a surgeon, it's my job. The camera is like a barrier and when I'm there, I'm working as a professional. But when I met Atola, I was struggling. Atola was eight years old when he was walking to school just a few miles from where I was injured in Afghanistan. It was just a couple of months after my own injury. And as he walked to school that day, he stepped on a landmine. He lost his left leg and his left arm. He was at the prosthetics fitting center, walking between two parallel bars. I was at the opposite end, making his photograph. Normally people react to seeing me there. They smile, they laugh, we have some kind of communication. But Atola just looked through me. This young boy with a plastic leg, his left arm swinging useless, was walking towards me. And as I was taking his photograph, I was thinking of the pain that I am in every day of my life, both physical and emotional. And I was thinking, why should an eight-year-old boy have to go through what I go through every day simply because he was walking to school? And that is the reality of these weapons. But what am I here to ask for? What is it that this burden of 20 years of stories has made me think? And that is that we must give opportunity to victims of landmines so they can become survivors. A couple of years ago, I was in um, Cambodia and I met a man who had been injured as a child. He was forced to fight for the Khmer Rouge. Um, he had lost both his legs. He was now 50, the same age as me, but he'd never been given support. He was crawling around on the floor at a prosthetic center. He'd never had the right prosthetics to work with him. He had never had physiotherapy, never had any support. The next day he invited me to go and visit him where he lived with his sister. 
His sister was a wonderful woman but lived in poverty and was struggling to feed her own family. This man took me to the side of this house and he pointed at three dog baskets on the floor. He pointed at the largest one and he said, that is where I sleep. This man was no different to me. I'm no stronger than he was. He is as resilient, he is determined as I am. And what is the difference between him and me? Opportunity, opportunity. I have an amazing life. I get to travel the world. Um, I work presenting TV shows, cooking, doing all the things I ever dreamt of doing. This man lives like a dog. There is a difference between a victim and a survivor. And the difference between a victim and a survivor is the opportunity to have your life back. I've said again and again, there is no point saving a life if we do not give somebody their life back. And that is what I'm here to say on behalf of all those victims around the world. Right now, there is a child waking up in Yemen, in Angola, in Laos, in Ukraine, and they are waking up to the reality that they have lost a limb to a landmine. And they are waking up to the reality of being a victim. And we have the choice as to whether they can become survivors. Thank you. Thank, thank you so very much for that. Uh, and now uh, I'll turn the floor over to our correspondents for questions. Uh, we have time just for a, a few. Uh, Edie first, and then uh, and then Betu. Uh, thank you very much on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association. Thank you very much for doing this briefing, and especially to you, Mr. Dooley, for that beautiful and uh, heartwarming appeal. My name is Edith Lederer from the Associated Press. Um, Madam President, you, you mentioned uh, reports that Russia is using landmines in Ukraine. Um, what would your appeal is, first of all, I don't think many of us know, is Ukraine a party to the uh, Landmines Convention? And secondly, what, what would your appeal be to uh, Russia at this time especially and to Ukraine as well? Well, thank you very much for your question. Uh, Ukraine is a state party. Russia is not a state party. And uh, uh, my appeal, or I think the, the people and the state parties appeal, would be that anti-personal minds only cause victims. They don't resolve any type of problem. So please, to Russia, please stop using them because many of the people that are victims of landmines have nothing to do with their problem or what's, what's happening between Ukraine and Russia. Okay. Uh, Petula? Thank you very much for the press conference. Petulir, Turkish News Agency, Anadolu. You talked about the landmines, but I'm just wondering if the UN mine action is aware of the floating sea mines in the Black Sea region, uh, uh, Black Sea. And just recently, the Turkish Defense Ministry said that they deactivated two uh, floating sea mines. Is this a concern to you? And is this a threat to international uh, shipping, given uh, how busy the Bosphorus Strait uh, gets for um, international ship and international uh, shipping and trading. Thanks. It's a question for me or for you? Uh, to, to any of you. Uh, any of the speakers want to take this up? Please, uh, please uh, come, come to the microphone if you do. Good morning. Um, I'm Luca Renda from UN Development Program. Um, we are coordinating mine action work in Ukraine. Um, on this particular issue, um, I unfortunately cannot confirm, or you know, I don't, don't have. We don't have access to that to that part, so we cannot 
provide more information about this, uh, the, the sea mines. We are aware of reports in the press, uh, and we are aware of the danger that this uh, constitutes for um, navigation and, and, and trade. But we are not in a position at the moment to, to say much more than that. Sorry about that. Th thanks very much. And with that, uh, I would want, like once more to, to thank all of our guests, uh, speakers. Uh, th thank you very much for your, for your extremely informative uh, uh, and moving presentations. And, and uh, I wish you all a good afternoon.